Should you buy a Sega Dreamcast in 2020? The Sega Dreamcast is now over 20 years old, and the Dreamcast is still awesome. But should you buy one today? Well, this is Stuff We Play, home of everything weird and retro. In today's buying guide, we're going over the hardware, software, and accessories uh, that are related, I guess, to the Sega Dreamcast in order to decide if you should buy one. Or if you still own one, you know, if you should still enjoy it. But first, allow me to tell you about today's sponsor, VidIQ. VidIQ is the number one Google Chrome extension for YouTube channel growth. As someone who is not only currently a YouTuber earning income off of their channel, but is also an experienced social media marketer, I can attest that VidIQ is one of the best tools out there for helping you to grow your channel. With a basic free plan, you can go ahead and get incredibly detailed analytics reports that will definitely help you get an idea of what's working and what's not with your channel. But for only $7.5 a month, you can also get vidIQ Pro, which will allow you to view expanded analytics and even access their keyword research tool. That in itself more than makes the subscription price worth it, as it allows you to look into keyword phrases for video titles before you even begin crafting the video itself. And yet, <gasps> that's not even the best part of vidIQ. All I just mentioned is what you can find through their website. With the browser extension, you'll begin to see this box appear next to videos that contains info on said videos, such as basic analytics and video tags. This is incredibly helpful for video research, and I can't vouch hard enough for how useful that is. So what are you waiting for? Either go to vidIQ.com or follow the affiliate link in the description below and check out vidIQ today. And now, with that, let's head back to the 90s and talk about the Sega Dreamcast. Ah yes, the Sega Dreamcast. Released on 9-9-1999 in North America, this was Sega's last major attempt to be a big name in the home video game console market. And, as we can see by them having left said market only two years after releasing this thing, that didn't work out too well. Yet, that doesn't mean that the Dreamcast was a bad console or that its library is lacking quality titles. Far from it. The Dreamcast is a fascinating piece of gaming history, not just because of what it has to offer, but also because of what it represents. On one hand, it represented the end of an era for Sega, an era that was also debatably marked as ending by Sonic Adventure 2 Battle releasing on the GameCube. However, it also represented new beginnings. Several absolutely classic series got their start in this thing, and in the years since its discontinuation, there's been a steady stream of homebrew releases by independent developers that have kind of kept this thing alive. Though its retail lifespan was short, as far as actual new releases go, the Dreamcast has been more alive than the likes of the Wii U since at least 2016. In addition to that, I absolutely love this console, and I'm really excited to be talking about it today. So let's briefly go over how I got my actual Dreamcast here. I bought it, goodness, it must have been around 8 years ago or so. It was from a store in Deerbrook Mall in Houston, Texas called 3D Games that is apparently not around anymore. I paid about 40 bucks for it, and I remember being particularly excited at the time because it came with both Sonic Adventure and Shenmue. And way before that, there was one kid in my neighborhood growing up who actually owned one of these things. Admittedly though, I don't think we ever played anything on it besides Echo the Dolphin. With that, let's go into the hardware found within the unit itself. Now, not counting regional variants and weird special edition consoles, there's only ever really one major version of the Dreamcast. I say major because there was never anything as drastic done between Dreamcast versions as there was, say, between the likes of the Genesis Model 1 and Model 2, or the launch model of the Sega Saturn and the Hitachi High Saturn. Well, actually, I take that back. There is one incredibly rare version of the console that was basically just a Dreamcast built into a TV, 
but those things are super rare and expensive, and I'll probably never own one of those. As for the Dreamcast aesthetic, it's small, it's sleek, it sounds like a hairdryer when you turn it on, and it's meant to be a beautiful pure white color. Unfortunately, mine is kind of yellowed after years of use and being sat next to a window, which means I should probably retrobrite it at some point. There's also two major things on the case that we should note. First is the Dreamcast logo on the top of the console. This is worth noting because in North America and Japan, this is orange. But if you're in a PAL region, it should be blue. I think they changed it in certain territories due to trademark reasons over in Europe, but I'm not completely sure. Regardless, it's an easy way to tell if you have a European console or not. As for the other marking, that's this Windows CE logo on the front. Something I mentioned a while back when I did my original Xbox buying guide was that, at one point, Sega and Microsoft had a rather close relationship. Had things gone slightly differently, Sega could have even been a major force behind the original Xbox's hardware. It is speculated by many that this is why Sega would put so many titles out on the original Xbox once the Dreamcast was discontinued. Regardless, what is known is that part of that special relationship between Sega and Microsoft led to Microsoft creating a custom version of Windows CE for the Dreamcast. That also came along with Microsoft creating their own development tools for the system. Despite Sega having their own tools available as well, Microsoft did this in order to make it easier to port PC games to this console. Inside the Dreamcast itself, there is a Hitachi SH4 processor clocked at 200 MHz. That was rather impressive for a console of the era, and in combination with all the other bits inside the Dreamcast, it was claimed by Sega that the Dreamcast could display over 7 million raw polygons per second. Again, quite impressive. The final bit of Dreamcast hardware that we need to talk about here is the built-in modem. Hmm, dial-up. I know it sounds primitive by today's standards, but this thing came out in 1999. Now, Sega had experimented with online gaming previously, most notably with the Netlink titles for the Sega Saturn, but the Dreamcast was their attempt to go all in on online gaming. As such, it became the first console to ever have native online capabilities. These features are perhaps most famously and effectively used with Fantasy Star Online. Of course, the official servers for that game are long gone. But that doesn't mean that you can't get onto some fan servers nowadays. Anyways, let's talk about those controllers. Hefty, comfortable, complete with a holder for not one, but two visual memory units, which is basically just a fancy memory card. It's like a precursor to the Xbox controller in all the best possible ways. My only issue of this thing is that the controller cable comes out of the bottom of it instead of the top, which definitely takes some getting used to. The most shocking thing about the Dreamcast, despite it ultimately bombing for Sega, is that they're actually pretty easy to come by nowadays. I see most of them range from about 50 to 60 US dollars whenever I see one, and most retro game stores I've been to tend to always have at least a few in stock. This means that, especially if there being several great games such as Sonic Adventure that I still regularly see priced for less than $20, that you could theoretically get a working Dreamcast and a few great games for under 100 bucks. So that raises a question. Why did the Dreamcast fail? One word, PS2. The PlayStation 2 released in 2000 and would be a phenomenon. Though great games such as Sonic Adventure had meant that the Dreamcast had actually lived a pretty prosperous life during 1999, and yes, even the beginning of 2000, after the PS2 launched, it was game over for Sega. I mean, you know, there are also a host of other problems as well, most caused by Sega themselves, and which I touched on a feature-length documentary I released on this channel last year, but needless to say, the PS2 is basically what nailed the Dreamcast's coffin shut. It's okay, Dreamcast. Even if you didn't sell well, I still love you. Regardless, if you're a game collector, especially a collector on a budget, then you know what? Yes, you should definitely buy a Dreamcast in 2020. But if you're a more general gaming enthusiast or still uncertain, then keep watching, because we're about to go over the Dreamcast software. The 
the Sega Dreamcast touched a lot of people. Despite basically being a 21-year-old zombie of a console that's only kept alive through a homebrew, and yeah, the release of stuff such as SD card readers and HDMI cables, I feel like the Dreamcast is likely more popular now than it was around late 2001 or 2002. Because of this though, a lot of the must-buy Dreamcast games have seen numerous ports to other platforms. For example, I love Crazy Taxi and Sonic Adventure, but you can play those on really pretty much anything nowadays. I mean, is there a Sonic Adventure DX port to LG Smart Fridges yet? So instead of going over some of my favorite games for the platform like I usually do in these buying guides, I've instead decided to do something a little different here today. First, I've invited some friends of mine to go over their favorite Dreamcast games. Then, after each of their entries, I'll go ahead and mention any additional ports those games have had and mention what I think is the best way to play them. So with that, let's hear from our first guest. In the Offspring hit Down the Line, they sing about a chain that's never broken. That chain is an endless string of passengers in Crazy Taxi. An infinite playthrough, picking up one passenger after another. It is the ultimate dream. Once that dream is achieved, humanity will have reached its peak. An unsuspecting high-octane arcade game, where you, the player, assume the role of a cab driver. The taxi is so crazy, constantly shifting from reverse to drive over and over makes it go faster. The San Francisco map you play on is like an extremely complicated painting. Every time you look at it, every time you play through it, you notice something new, a new strategy you can take advantage of, a new passenger hidden in a weird corner. In this one simple map, new strategies and techniques can be discovered and melt, making your high score higher and higher, getting you closer to the chain that's never broken. I'm Pandemonium, and Crazy Taxi is my favorite Dreamcast game. Crazy Taxi is one of my personal favorite games for the system, and it's also a blast to play in the arcades. Honestly though, I'm a bit split on which is the best version of it. On one hand, the Dreamcast version has an incredible licensed soundtrack. On the other hand though, the Xbox Live arcade port is a blast to play, and is also a lot easier to access nowadays. However, it's missing said soundtrack, and the replacement soundtrack kind of sucks. Whichever one of those you choose though, should really just come down to how much you value a great soundtrack. Jet Set Radio is by far my favorite Dreamcast game for numerous reasons. The concept was pretty simple. It's a semi-open world platformer where you basically rollerblade around and mark your territory by doing graffiti art. The cell shaded graphics work perfectly within this world and everything pops. Traversing is fun as you grind on rails and even on walls. You can even customize your graffiti art within the game, which was pretty intuitive at the time. The team even brought in street artists to help create the graffiti art in Jet Set Radio. And just like in real life, doing graffiti is going to bring cops on your tail, so they do the same thing in Jet Set Radio, except there's sometimes a tank involved. Look, graffiti is a serious crime here. You can recruit people to join your group, and they all have colorful personalities. The controls of this game are pretty mixed for me personally. I enjoy the tight platforming, but the slightest bump ruins all of your momentum. Jet Set Radio has gone on to become a cult classic, but it deserves far more recognition for what it brought to the table. While it did receive an HD remake, it deserves a proper sequel. Oh, and the DJ is pretty great too. Jet Set Radio, also known as Jet Grind Radio, is a game that, believe it or not, I've never played. However, I have played its sequel, Jet Set Radio Future, on the original Xbox. That one's good fun. That said, after doing some research, most of which involved me bugging some of my Sega collecting friends, it seems that they all agree that the original Dreamcast version is awesome, and if you want to play this one nowadays, you're perhaps best off getting the Steam version. Hi, I'm Joe. I run the YouTube channel Nilfinity Gaming, and my friend James asked me to talk about my favorite Dreamcast game which I'm going to cheat a little bit and all and kind of tie it in with one of my favorite GameCube games, which is also a remake of a Dreamcast game or it's Sonic Adventure 2 Battle everybody. This game was one of the two games I first got when I bought my GameCube. Adventure 2 Battle was this amazing like thing. It not only like bookended like the Dreamcast's run in terms of like a video game console and Sega's like 
console domain. But it was also this game that was just great. You know, the Son probably one of the best Sonic games, if not the best Sonic game. And it also had amazing music. Uh, we all know City Escape, come on. So yeah, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, one of the best video games of all times. There's been a lot of great ports of both this and Sonic Adventure 1 over the years. That said, I absolutely love this thing on the GameCube, and apparently the Steam version is pretty okay. I remember hearing that there are some issues with the PC versions a while back, but as far as I can tell, the Steam versions are pretty solid ports now. I bring you a box brought forth from the depths of hell. Deep inside, past through these comics, is a game where you and many others can fight against each other in the pits of hell or anywhere else. Fighting in an arena, seeing who is best in Spawn in the Demon's Hand. Made by Capcom in 2000, this here is one of my favorite Dreamcast games, as you and three others can fight in different arenas, choosing over 30 different characters to spread blood everywhere. Or you can go cheap and use Medieval Spawn and one hit kill everybody. Okay, legit, this is a game I was unfamiliar with before the creation of this video, and as far as my research shows, this is only ever seen release in arcades and on the Dreamcast. So, unless you have the money to plunk down a spawn arcade machine, it looks like the Dreamcast is the only way to give this one a try. Let's see here, favorite Dreamcast game, Super Puzzle Fighter 2X, I believe it's called? Big memory for me with that, particularly was playing that up in Alaska. And, you know, going between different games and everything, you know, I said, oh, I'm just going to play single player for a little bit. And the next thing I know, there was a huge crowd of people behind me as I'm playing this in the rec room and everyone was just going, oh, wow, what's that? Yeah, it's really, really one of the more memorable moments for that particular game for me. But, uh, yeah, it's a great game. Still got playable today. I recommend that to anyone. So this one is actually a Japanese exclusive release. That's actually a bit unfortunate, because the Dreamcast is region locked. Without modding, of course. It is a great game, though, and from my brief experiences with this version, I think this one is just a bit better than the PS1 port. That said, that PS1 version was included on the PlayStation Classic, and it's one of the few games that actually runs properly on that thing. To learn more about that, though, check out that buying guide. When people usually reminisce about the Sega Dreamcast, I tend to think why Soul Calibur isn't brought up more often. When Soul Calibur first came out for the Dreamcast, it got perhaps some of the highest reviews any game ever, especially at that time, has ever received. We're talking about 10 out of 10s everywhere. And it's a really amazing fighting game to play to this very day, especially since it blew the arcade version out of the water. It looked great, it sounded great, still has one of my favorite soundtracks in any fighting game ever, and the fact that they tried to port it just not too long ago on the Xbox 360 and completely botched the port, doesn't even have the classic mission mode, means that the Dreamcast is the one place to experience Soul Calibur 1 the best way possible. One thing to keep in mind with any port of any game is that not all ports are created equal. Let's take a look at one of my favorite Dreamcast games, Shenmue. This game got a port to the PS4 and Xbox One along with its sequel a couple years back. Apparently though, that was a bit of a problematic port. But I think it's worth mentioning here, as the price of the original Shenmue shot up a bit when Shenmue 3 was announced, and has only recently begun to come down again. Plus, apparently many of the issues with the modern console ports have been ironed out since launch. But if you don't want to risk any issues, then perhaps just get the Dreamcast original. Now, let's talk about that homebrew scene. After the Dreamcast was formally pulled off the market, a homebrew development scene slowly began to grow for it. Initially, this seems to have been mostly centered in Japan, though of course there were other titles being made in other parts of the world. However, we also need to talk about Japan specifically here, because there would be new, official Dreamcast releases in Japan all the way until 2007. Seriously, Karus and Tiggerheart Excelsia, Excelica, uh, th those games, both of those are officially licensed Dreamcast games that came out six years after the console was formally discontinued. 
At that point, Sega issued an ultimatum on new Dreamcast releases, since they just weren't stopping. Basically, anyone who wanted to could make new games for the platform, but they would no longer have to go through Sega to get them approved. Sega just wanted nothing more to do with the system itself anymore, but they also didn't want to disappoint Dreamcast fans. As a result, there has been a fairly steady stream of new Dreamcast releases from indie studios ever since. On average, there have been about 10 or so new Dreamcast games each year, and while that doesn't sound like much, remember that these are entirely independent releases for a console that is now over 20 years old. Some notable games that have been released on the Dreamcast in the past 15 years are FX Unit Yuki, Pier Solar, and Another World HD. With that, I'd like to go over the only homebrew game I own for the system, Feet of Fury. This game is actually important for a couple of reasons. First, upon release in 2003, it became the very first independent Dreamcast game. And second, it can actually be played in a variety of ways. This game takes a lot of inspiration from the likes of Dance Dance Revolution and is a rhythm game where you have to match directional inputs to the beat. However, you aren't forced to just use a dance pad with this title. I mean, that's an option, but you can also use other input methods, such as a standard controller, or even the Dreamcast keyboard. Also, that reminds me of another of my favorite Dreamcast games, The Typing of the Dead, which I think means that we're at a good point to go into the final section of the video. Dreamcast Accessories Let's talk about accessories. There are a lot of them, and I only have experience with two of them. The first is the Dreamcast keyboard, and that's only because of the typing of the dead. I don't even own the game, but a local game store near me has a trend of holding typing of the dead tournaments every Halloween. It's an absolute blast, and it really makes you realize how much more interesting Mavis Beacon Teach's typing would be if you could kill zombies. The second of these accessories is the VMU. Now, along with acting as a standard memory card, these can also act as a simple visual display for your games and even as their own mini consoles. That's why they had the little D-pad and stuff on them, but not a lot of games took advantage of that. Anyways, I'm not nearly hardcore of enough of a Dreamcast collector to own all of the accessories for it. I mean, really, I'm just a nerd in the internet who likes to talk about old video games, but I still wanted this section to be in depth. So, to help me out here, I've invited my buddy G from G to the Next Level to go over every single Dreamcast accessory he owns and to also help me avoid being torn apart by Sega collectors in the comments section. So if we're going to be talking about the Sega Dreamcast, the incredible system that came out on 9999 and how I absolutely love the system from the very beginning until the bitter end. The system that basically was just way ahead of its time was over well too soon. Now, if there's one takeaway aside from its incredible gaming library that I have for the system, it's its wacky accessories. And I'm not talking about just like, you know, the light guns and the VMUs, like everybody knows about those. I'm talking about some of the other more random accessories that I love. A couple that I can really call out to are like this one here. Like this one is the, the Sega Dreamcast fishing accessory now what's cool about this guy is that i have such fond memories of playing this game of playing sega bass fishing in the arcade and this game so close because the thing about the dreamcast that was so awesome in this kind of sega as a whole was bringing the arcade experience home and that's exactly what this did because it feels like it especially when you start the game to anybody who's ever played sega bass fishing before and whenever you start the game it's just like fight and you just start you know swiggling as hard as you can and trying not to break the reel and just trying to bring it in of course it has the analog stick and it has the button so you can mimic from being able to move from side to side while you're playing the game and and uh, this guy was made by ascii which i believe made the one i think it was bass landing was the name of it for the ps1 so it makes sense for sega for them to to reach out to them to make this fishing controller i even have one complete in box i absolutely loved it i was one of the the uh the accessories that i had to get pretty much as soon as it came out for the dreamcast now one other one uh is another strange one and that's uh <laughs> seaman so seaman was a game that even when i was in college and playing this game i didn't quite understand exactly how it works but what was really cool about seaman is that it also came with this it came with an adapter that goes into your controller that was a microphone 
And what was cool about this guy is that because the seaman, you basically had to talk to it and to communicate with it, and it would ask you questions, and it would change from day to day, depending on you know how well you kept your seaman, seaman alive. And this is really really cool. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the little green nubbin that goes on the top of my microphone, but it still works like a champ to this day. But uh, even that, I haven't really thought to fire up seaman. Uh, since I actually replaced my copy of it. I wonder what it's like now. Or what if, you know, I decide to play Christmas Seaman? <laughs> yeah, of course, since this one's all in Japanese, that makes it even harder, but this was still a really cool accessory that, again, I thought was ahead of its time. It even came out in the sequel in Seaman 2 for PS2 that was built into the special controller. And then probably the craziest accessory that I have for the Dreamcast and that I can really think of is this right here, which took me forever to get because when I was younger, I could never find the Sama de Amigo Maracas. But yeah, this is the complete set of Sama de Amigo for the Dreamcast with the Maracas controllers. Now, for those who aren't familiar with Amigo, if you haven't seen him in other Sega games like Sega Superstars Tennis or Sonic and All-Stars Racing, basically it's a rhythm game and also got remade for the Wii as well. But you actually use motion sensors and maracas. And they actually fully on shake and it captures your motion because you have to hit them on the screen in time with the music. So, should you buy a Sega Dreamcast in 2020? Honestly, it depends. I know that's a lame answer, but hear me out. Look at the game library. If the only Dreamcast games you want to play are all on Steam or PS4, then maybe just go that route. But if you're a game collector or just interested in trying out the likes of The Typing of the Dead or Spawn, then absolutely buy the real hardware. It's a lot of fun. Though I joked about Sega collectors earlier, my experience with the Dreamcast collecting and homebrew communities is that they're all mostly a rather positive bunch. A lot of consoles, such as the TurboGrafx-16 and the GameCube, are just too expensive to collect for nowadays, at least for my liking. But the Dreamcast? I mean, sure, it has its fair share of expensive games, I'm looking at you, Mars Matrix, but getting a hold of the console itself and a few fun titles really isn't that hard to do. For those seeking a game console that's both weird and retro, but that isn't particularly dated or expensive, then the absolute best of the best is the Sega Dreamcast. But anyways, that's it for this Sega Dreamcast buying guide. I promised this vid last year, and I originally wanted out for the 20th anniversary of the Dreamcast. But then, life happened, so it ended up on the back burner for a while. With that, I'd like to once again give a special shout out to vidIQ for sponsoring this video. They have some of the absolute best analytic and keyword research tools out there, and for those looking to get started on YouTube, they're an absolute must. In fact, in creating this very video, vidIQ's video analytic box was incredibly helpful, as it allowed me to look at similar videos and really just get an idea of what made them work well analytics-wise. You can find out more about vidIQ by going to vidIQ.com or by following the affiliate link in the description below. On that note, I'd like to give a shout out to some of my awesome patrons on Patreon and my YouTube channel members. Those folks are Justin Chipman, The Golden Bolt, Dylan Ola, Robert and Abby Hornerbrook, List, Eli Cole, and G to the Next Level. And yes, that's the same G who appeared earlier in this video. He and all of my other friends who joined me today are all great folks, and you can find links to their channels in the description below. So with that, what buying guide should I do in the future? Can we all agree that the Dreamcast never truly died? Let me know in the comment section below, and while you're at it, subscribe to Stuff We Play for more great content like this. Thank you very much for watching, stay classy, and I'll see you next time.